Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Carolyn if you're new here and today I'm going to be doing an attempted super speedy May wrap up. Um, the past few months I've been doing a part one and part two wrap up and I just didn't do it this month um, so I'm going to try and not be super long winded and get through these 11 books as quickly as possible. Um, overall I think I had a really great reading month. I wouldn't be surprised if more than one of these books ended up on my um, best books of the year so we will see. Um, but I thought, let's just jump into it, let's not waste any more time. Um, first, I will talk about Heartberries by Therese Mary Malhot. Um, so this was sent to me by Miriam, such a doll. Um, this is a very, very um, brief, short memoir. Um, I also read this with Steffi from Perks of Steph. Um, this is a tough, challenging book. We said that like our next buddy read needs to be something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, but this was really, really beautiful. Um, I kind of like annotated it to death. Um, it's really about um, Therese's struggle with her mental health and I think she really um, is very vulnerable in this book because she portrays herself sometimes in a not so positive light and she's just really honest about where she was mentally and kind of all these different periods of her life um, and kind of what stood out to me the most is how um, she really showed how she felt burdensome um, in all these different relationships with her child and with her partner that she just really struggled to feel like um, she was a burden in their lives which I think is something that a lot of people can relate to and again the relationship with her partner I think was the most challenging parts to read about because she felt so insecure and so vulnerable and she was so angry a lot of the time um, and I think she really shows how hard and complicated it is when you're in a relationship with somebody who life, it just seems easier for them um, and kind of how that can lead to resentment and feelings of guilt but also feeling like you need them and that you rely on them. Um, so I think she just kind of covered so many complexities of emotion um, in a very, very short book and it's also some of the best lines like absolutely stunning. I took so many notes on this book, um, just lines that really, really spoke to me. And I think when I'm reading a memoir, I obviously don't always need to relate to it to love it. And to, I'll talk about another memoir later that I didn't really relate to at all, but that was so, so incredible that it doesn't matter. But I think this one, there were so many elements that just kind of spoke to me personally that I just would wholeheartedly recommend it. I gave it a five star. It deserves nothing less. Um, and I just think it's absolutely worth worthwhile. It's definitely a challenging book. Um, but if you are able to read this right now, I would absolutely recommend it. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So I'm so, so glad I read it. So that is Heartberries. Next up, change of pace. <laughs> change of pace here. You can see my erratic reading um, taste. The Pisces by Melissa Broder. So I'm sure you've seen this book before. This is about... A woman who um, gets out of a very messy relationship and goes to house sit and dog sit for her sister who's on vacation and she's going to group therapy and then she's kind of going on these blind dates and trying to figure herself out again and she meets a sea man, a sea creature man and gets into a relationship with him and it's steamy and grungy and sexy and gross. Um, Definitely Moshpegian in style. Um, I think some of the best parts of these, this book is just like her commentary, her like inner monologue of, for example, she's like going to this these group therapies and she is so judgmental of all the other women in, in these groups. Um, and then like obviously she's not doing super well herself. So I just think that obviously it sounds ridiculous that it's about a C creature relationship and it definitely feels like a little bit shape of water at some moments but it's really so much more than that. Um, you see a woman at her lowest points really struggling trying to find herself again. Um, feelings of insecurity and of kind of anger and rage at the world uh, but I loved the writing style of this. It's like super in your face punchy um, and again like Melissa Broder's not hiding from any kind of gross nitty gritty details. Um, she shows this woman in all her in all her glory, um, but I really really enjoyed it. This is like a 4.5 star 
book for me, which I was surprised because I was not expecting to love a book about a very intense sexual relationship between a woman and a sea creature as much as I did, but I was right there with her. I loved it. <laughs> I was committed to this um, story, to this protagonist, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I, it was a romp, and sometimes you just need something a little bit lighter, even though sometimes it's also dark, but it's like l the laugh at yourself, you're not doing super well kind of humor, so I was surprised by how much I loved this, so would recommend. Then, let's go to a book that I just don't... I don't know. So this is Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. This was long listed for the Booker in 2020. And I am charged with explaining to you the synopsis of this book, which is a challenge. Um, so it opens up with a couple, Rachel and Eliza, and they are in a kind of weird spot in their relationship. Um, Rachel really wants to have a child. Eliza is hesitant and unsure. And um, maybe it's because Rachel, she doesn't think Rachel's ready to become a mother or that she'll be able to handle becoming a mother. And Eliza is like a scientist, very fact-based. And Rachel is kind of like, not. <laughs> I don't know the best way to say it. Um, and Rachel believes one night that an ant has crawled into her eye and gone into her brain and it's like this pivotal moment in their relationship which sounds ridiculous but you know like you have these moments in your relationship where it's like make or break and it seems kind of absurd but this specific moment is theirs and Rachel says an ant just crawled into my brain Eliza if you don't believe me then we can't move forward and make a family have a family um, because you just don't have faith in me and Eliza chooses to say okay I believe you even though she doesn't. And she kind of takes it as a metaphor, but for Rachel it's, um, it's real. There's actually an ant in her brain. So then we kind of follow them in different like iterations almost of their life, their life together um, and choosing to have a child. And obviously each chapter is kind of introduces you to a different famous thought experiment and then takes you to another iteration of Rachel and Eliza's life um, or kind of adjacent to their life. You'll see what I'm talking about if you read this book. Um, and there were some points where I was like right there with Sophie Ward. I was really like I was really enjoying the writing style um, and kind of the complexities of all these different relationships. Um, and then it just lost me. I just need someone to like hold my hand and walk me through this book. I was just confused. Um, and it kind of takes a direction that I really wasn't expecting which I think I could enjoy in other books. Um, I love some weirdness. I just thought it got too messy and I, it, it wasn't the book I don't think. Maybe it was me. I just couldn't follow it. I'm just not smart enough to understand this book. Um, if you've read it, please let me know what you think and like what you took away from it. Um, I gave it a three star um, because there were moments that like I could absolutely like grasp onto. I understood what was happening. I thought it was really interesting looking at all these kind of different relationships and how they kind of come together and affect one another um, and these thought experiments just like reading those little blurbs about those is really interesting and kind of trying to find your own way to make those connect to these different kind of little stories in between um, but as a whole I just don't think I got it so someone help someone help and let me know what you took away from this book because I just need someone to explain okay and then let's talk about Freshwater by Quakey Amezi. This is one of the books that I think could be on my top books of 2021. Um, I loved it. I read it because Iggy had been raving about it. And thank you so much, Iggy, because this is kind of one of those books that I'll never forget. Um, so this is about a young girl named Ada. We follow her from adolescence into young adulthood, um, follow her to college where she has a very traumatic event happen to her and as like a coping mechanism almost she forms these different personalities um, to kind of take the brunt of those traumatic moments um, so that she can feel safe. So it really is like the narrative voice or voices of this book are all these different personalities that come to life in Ada and that are born of these traumatic moments so that Ada can kind of cope and live another day. Um, so 
I think at the beginning of this book I struggled because there is definitely like a spirituality to this book that I think a lot of it is based in like Nigerian religion or, or faith that I just don't, I'm not familiar with. But I think you don't need to have, you don't need to like understand that to love this book because each kind of chapter is um, from the perspective of one of these personalities that come to life in Ada. And if you look at them more as these personalities or these, she refers to them as gods, um, I think there's so much to take away from this book. I thought it was so, so powerful. And I was saying to Ben, Ben Green, who also read this book, and I was like messaging him being like, what's happening? Help me. Um, and I think what I found so incredible about this book is that how Amezi uses these gods or these personalities to deconstruct and explore gender binaries or Ada's sexuality, the fluidity of her sexuality, um, by using these voices, these very um, specific individualistic voices that you, you know who you're reading from um, and they really feel vibrant even though they're all kind of constricted and um, held within Ada's physical body. Um, when you feel for Ada and you kind of watch her um, allow these different sides of her and these different pieces of her to kind of take center stage at different moments or times in her life um, to kind of protect her own heart and protect her body. Um, I just thought it was fascinating how Amezi uses these gods, um, which is like this overwhelming faith and spirituality to this book, to talk about things um, that you would just never pair with that, right? Um, so she talks about Ada's kind of um, her spectrum of sexuality and kind of where she is at different moments of her life and she talks about um, Ada's gender representation and identity through these different voices. Um, fascinating. I gave this a five star. Cannot recommend it enough. It's one of the highlights of my reading year so far. Uh, just fantastic. Truly, truly fantastic. I will be thinking about this one for a long time to come. Okay. And then let's just get this book. I just want to talk about it and move on kind of. This is Saraland by River Solomon. If you've watched any of my previous videos you might know that I read The Deep last year and absolutely loved it by River Solomon um, and this one was just not a success for me um, even though I was so so excited about it. So this is about a woman, well she's a girl at the beginning, Vern, who um, at the beginning of the book escapes from this commune, this cult, um, that where she's been raised and she is in the woods and she gives birth to twins and she's, it's really a survival story at the beginning. Um, and it's very tense and atmospheric and she um, is being chased or hunted by, she calls this figure a fiend, this fiend who's hunting her. Um, and it's very, very scary and really atmospheric and she's raising her children to be kind of genderless and take on the world in a new way. Um, and I think Vern is a fascinating character to read from, so I loved the beginning. And then it just got a little bit messy for me, and it had this book had so many of the elements that The Deep had. Like, it had um, kind of these fantastical elements, it had a queer romance, it had social commentary, it had um, historical elements, and those were all things that The Deep had, which I loved. But I think this book, maybe it was just because it was too long and it just got messy at the end, I think. Um, so many of the elements that I loved in this book just didn't, they weren't explored fully or maybe there was too much going on that I just felt it got really messy because um, it just lost its way for me. Um, it gets very strange, which I am there for. Like, her body starts to warp and change and become something alien to herself um, and she believes that it has ties to her life on living in this commune, living in this cult. Um, and I think what this book does well is it has a lot of historical references that I thought were really, really powerful. It has um, social commentary. It's um, really angry at establishments and at um, the American government and about white supremacy and the abuses of power. And it talks about it in a really unique, imaginative way, but kind of all these different elements just got too messy for me and in the end it felt almost like Stranger Things. Um, I think the weirdness took over and it lost a little bit of um, kind of the history elements and the um, political and social elements. That is what I kind of wanted from it. Um, so really by the end I was just trying to like push through it. I 
gave this book a three star on Goodreads just because I so loved the beginning that it felt unfair to rate it lower than that, but I think it might be like a 2.75 just because by the end I was struggling to get through it and it just totally lost its way for me and I, yeah, I was not enjoying it by the end, but let me know what you think if you read this book. Um, okay. And then I read another mosh bag. I read Eileen. This is her debut novel. This is about a young woman named Eileen who um, is charged with caring for her ailing father who's suffering from alcoholism and he's not exactly kind to her and she is also working at a boys prison um, and she is just not doing super well. She kind of is yearning for something more but she's also a very dark and complicated character herself. Um, she has all these fantasies about these people around her and she, she's this is a woman who projects she kind of projects her hopes and dreams onto these various people who she doesn't really actually have a relationship with it's all in her head um what's so interesting about this book is that eileen works in this boys prison who um she comes into contact with boys who have done some really violent things um but in her own mind she kind of is leaning that way a lot of the times and she comes into contact eventually which actually comes a lot later in the book that I was expecting, but she meets this woman, Rebecca, who also starts to work at this prison, and again, she's projecting her, like, hopes and dreams onto this woman, um, as a hope to, like, be more than she is right now, um, and it gets very dark and messy and wonderful. Again, I love Mosh Fag's characters, I think. They're so vivid, they're so, like, sometimes gruesome, but fantastic, um, you kind of root for Eileen, you're like, oh, that's not the best, you feel bad for her, but you also really don't like her. So Moshfag kind of puts you through it <laughs> with Eileen. She's not letting you off easy. She's not letting you kind of place Eileen in one category or the next. Um, I don't think I enjoyed this as much as the other two Moshfags that I've read, um, but I really had a good time. It gave this one like a four star. Um, I would definitely recommend it. It's dark. It's depressing, but it's also really, really fun, which, you know, I'm there for all the time. So that was Eileen. And then I read another highlight of my year, and that is Inferno, a memoir of motherhood and madness by Catherine Cho. It's a memoir about a woman named Catherine who um, gives birth to a son, and within a few weeks they decide to take um, a vacation to the U.S. to visit family. Um, and when they're in Paramus, New Jersey, which is actually like right down the road from me, um, she has a psychotic break and is involuntarily taken into um, a mental hospital and is treated for um, a psychotic break that's in um, because of postpartum stress. Uh, so I think this book was absolutely fascinating of what it talks about because obviously we talk about postpartum depression, but this is a really, really intimate look at these within a few days of kind of the terror and the trauma and the paranoia and the fear and the confusion that Catherine experienced. Um, what I love so much about this book is that she really kind of takes you there with her. She's keeping these journal entries and just trying to come back to herself so desperately and remember who she is. Um, and I think what kind of I was left with from this book is that, first of all, she has an incredible partner and I think that really helped her get through it, but also that were really failing kind of new postpartum people. Um, kind of in the hospital she immediately is made to feel like just a vessel that gave birth to this child and that her needs aren't being met and I think she explores that really well and then even just in her own um, familiar relationships all this pressure and judgments that's put on her as a new mother um, that she just is trying her best right and she already is feeling kind of dissociated from herself. I just absolutely loved this book it's really a woman's struggle to find herself again and to remember who she is in relationship to kind of becoming a new mom, but she's also more than that and I think she's not leaving you with a happy ending. Um, she's saying that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but I just found it absolutely fascinating. I loved the writing of this book. It's one again that I will think about for a long time to come, so this was like an easy five star for me. Um, I just, I just absolutely loved it, so that was Inferno. And then I read another one that I'm not sure how to think about, and that is Lanny by Max Porter. Again, a booker, an almost booker baby. Um, in 2019 it was um, long-listed, yeah, long-listed. 
So this has been on my TBR for a very long time. It's a very slim little novel. It has fantastical elements and kind of cozy cottage core elements at the same time. So this is about a young boy named Lanny who lives in the English, country, in English countryside with his two parents and um, we don't actually hear from Lanny himself, but we hear from his parents and then from this fantastical legend character who actually takes physical form, who's um, called Dead Papa Toothwort. Um, he is kind of unique to this town and to the town's identity and culture and Dead Papa Toothwort feeds off of or kind of gets energy from the townspeople's voices and their thoughts. He can kind of go into different homes and different moments and um, yeah, like feed off of their thoughts. And he really enjoys Lanny, maybe because he's just like a young, whimsical child, so he enjoys listening to Lanny um, and engaging with Lanny. Um, but again, I said it in my vlog, this book is very, very different than I was anticipating. It's a lot darker and I think it does have a lot of social commentary. Um, it really is about kind of childhood imagination and whimsy, but also about how quickly a town can go from cozy and whimsical to dark and judgmental. And it makes a small, cozy town all of a sudden feel oppressive, which I think it absolutely did. The ending I thought was very, very strange, and I think I enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if I understood it, but I think it plays with nature and with childhood imagination about basically kind of the failure of adults to understand their children and trying to confine them and mold them into something that they think is acceptable as you kind of grow up. Um, so I gave this one like a 3.5. It is definitely not what I was expecting. It is much darker <laughs> than what I was expecting, but I enjoyed it. I think it's, again, so unique um, that I would recommend it just for that because I think that very strange writing style is a very interesting way to kind of experience all these different voices, like a myriad of voices, in a very unique um, way. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it, but I think I enjoyed it. Okay, the last book that I've not already talked about in a vlog that I read, um, Unearth Were Briefly Gorgeous, Unor Unearth Were Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Wong. Um, obviously, everyone has read this book by now. It is a piece of autofiction that is definitely representative of a lot of Ocean Wong's own life, but it is written as a letter to his um, mother who can't read, um, can't read English. So it was just beautiful. Obviously, Ocean Wong's a poet, and you can see that in this, these words. Um, it kind of explores Little Dog's first love and his first relationship and the intimacy and vulnerability and fear and heartbreak of that. Um, which I thought was some of my favorite parts, and it also explores his relationship with his mom and his grandmother, and kind of looking back on these moments that, as a young boy, you're never going to share with your mom, right? Um, but because she can't actually read these words, he gives himself more space to talk through these things to somebody who's central to his life and his identity, but, but also so much of his identity has been kept secret and private from her, which is natural as a child, but then also because he's realizing that he's gay and he's in this relationship and he just feels like this barrier with his mom. Um, and sometimes his mom seems cruel to him and I think he's working through that as well. Um, but I just think this was beautiful. I mean, everyone said it. I don't think I need to talk anymore for this book. It definitely <laughs> speaks for itself. But this was again a five star, so I had a good amount of five stars this month. Um, just beautiful. Just really beautiful and I um, definitely can be a tearjerker at some points. And then the two books I talked about in dedicated reading vlogs, Hummingbird Salamander by Jeff Vandermeer. I won't talk about this too much because I talked about it a lot. Um, this is about a woman, Jane Smith is her alias, who works in big tech and something secretive um, and morally gray, I think. And one day she gets given a key by a barista in a coffee shop that leads her to a storage unit where there is a taxidermied hummingbird. And it sends her on this mission to see why she was left this. She kind of, her eyes are completely opened up to a new way of viewing the world. Um, she gets involved with people who are in like wildlife trafficking and with taxidermy and with big game hunting. And she realizes all these dark webs 
um, that are working through the world that are really causing ecological disaster. Um, the middle of this book lost me a little bit. It was definitely find the bad guys, hide the hide from the bad guys type of book. Um, but the ending was fantastic and beautiful, and I would recommend it just to get to that ending. And I think Vandermeer is a writer I will always read from. Um, yeah, I loved it. Very strange, but it is really about ecological disasters and what we're doing to the world, and it's really like an animal rights activism book with a very strange twist. So, would definitely recommend that. I gave it a four star. And then I read the second book in the Dublin Murder Squad series um, by Tana French. So the first book is In the Woods, which I read in January, I believed, I believe, and loved it. Um, this follows one of the two detectives in that book, Cassie. And the case is very, very strange. So Cassie um, is notified of a woman who has been murdered that looks identical to her as her doppelganger, but also has the identification of an alias that Cassie made up when she was working in Undercover. Um, so while she's trying to figure out who murdered this woman who's going by the name Lexi, she's also trying to figure out why she was using that identification, and Cassie goes undercover again, which she hasn't done in a long time, and infiltrates Lexi's old life. And she moves in with her roommates who don't know that the real Lexi is dead, um, and it's all about figuring out the friend group and the dynamics and I think this book is similar to The Secret History in that way of a very unyielding tight-knit friend group that seems kind of creepy at some points um, and you want to be involved in all these secret conversations to figure out what's going on and Cassie, as you can imagine, gets too involved, similar to In the Woods, and it gets really messy. Um, these books are long, they might feel slow at some points, but it's really about character and building the tension in all these smaller moments and not these big kind of what you would expect from a mystery thriller. Um, there's no like big chase, um, but I really enjoyed it and I will continue on in this series, probably again spacing them out because they're big, um, but I just love Tana French. So yes, those are all the books I read in the month of May. Please let me know if you've read any of these and your thoughts, um, but then also let me know the favorite your favorite that you read in this past month. Um, I have very exciting reading plans for June, so I am looking forward to that. And thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I will be back soon with another video. Bye, everyone.